In the end, the most live ammunition we see today is in the form of technology enablement. Firms like ours, Cognizant, give us a chance to do this at scale. Millions of records of patients generating active insights via you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and the latest in this space that really applies to patient improvement, solving for unmet medical need. And now weirdly, we have come back full center to today, the patient is the center of the universe. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm your host, Jeremy Bergeron. Our guest today is Avi Kulkarni, the Senior Vice President of Health Sciences at the IT services and consulting company, Cognizant. From his position at the cutting edge of healthcare innovation, Avi suggests that new medical technology is in fact putting patients right back in the center of the universe. Stay right here to learn about the new developments that are revolutionizing the healthcare field and what marketing strategies Cognizant is using to raise awareness about its mission. And before we get into the podcast, I want to say thank you to our partners at Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. If you want to learn more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. Now let's get into it. Your background, I, I find really interesting, you know, so I, I want to kind of get to this part here because I love this, this idea. So you, you got an MBA from Stanford, great, great school. You got a PhD and MS degrees in pharmaceutics from Temple University, a BS in pharmacy from the University of Bombay. Um, so you have this, certainly this, a pretty deep and vast experience. You have this MBA, of course, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial entrepreneurship as part of your pillars, which I want to talk about. Then you have this, this medicine pharmaceutical background and you're kind of blending these two now at Cognizant. Um, but I, I want to hear a little bit from you anecdotally on these these pillars that strategy, operational performance, entrepreneurship, scientific experience, and scholarship. Tell us a little bit about these. Why are these important to you? And, and how, to, how to, what meaning does this have for you? Jeremy, thanks for asking. You know, like a lot of kids who have uh, physicians in their families, my earliest memories of a career, if you can call it that, was I wanted to be a doctor. And somewhere in that process of high school and thinking about college, I realized that physicians affect one patient at a time, whereas pharmaceutical companies affect hundreds of thousands of patients with one development, with one drug release. It was very close to me personally because my sister was born with a blood disorder that was to take her life. We knew that someday uh, soon. And the whole watching the drugs she had to take and the journey she was on and understanding that at that time there was no cure, there was potentially bone marrow transplantation, which, you know, 40, 50 years back was quite barbaric and had not so great outcomes. So long story short is I dedicated my life at one stage to being a pharmacist, a pharmaceutical industry specialist. And the questions I've asked myself since that time, which is 40 plus years back, um, all the questions are, how can I know more about this? So the arc of my career is first being a pharmacist, then saying value is created when drugs are invented. And so that was my next immediate step. Be a PhD, be a bench scientist, uh, have records of invention. I have some of my own. I have some fun stories about things that did not work. And then came the, well, but that's not enough. If all you do is, is invent and in this 10 to 20 year cycle where you're taking instructions from someone who's done portfolio analysis and solving for unmet medical needs, it just felt not quite close enough to the decision-making authority. And that was the MBA. It was a chance to say, let me reinvent myself within my industry and be a strategist. And that was the, you know, working for booze and being the global head of life sciences R&D and now working with very senior clients and helping influence their decisions. And along the way, essentially at every stage, I used to ask the same question, is what I'm doing going to be something, one more arrow in the quiver of serving the industry that's just become my vocation? Everything mm. has been part of that. The entrepreneurship, the, the biotech companies I, I started or joined in their very early stages, all the way through today, the reason to be at Cognizant is a fairly recent discovery for me that in the end, the most live ammunition we see today is in the form of technology enablement. And if we don't get that right, it just becomes back to, to you know, we're, we're helping sort of one one MS Word solution at a time. 
And we got to make this bigger. And, you know, firms like ours, Cognizant, give us a chance to do this at scale. You know, millions of records of patients generating active insights via, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and the latest in this space that really applies to patient improvement, solving for unmet medical need. And now, weirdly, if I can just say this last thing, then I'll stop. We have come back full center to today, the patient is the center of the universe. And a phrase from decades back, right? Mass customization is appearing to be brought about in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and by the way, the story of my sister, cell and gene therapies, and I can tell you more about this, have already shown phase three data, so close to being on the market for beta thalassemia, which is the disease that took her life. Oh, wow, that's amazing context. That I, I'm curious about the the beginning of this dance with scale and impact, right? So there's at some point for you, you realized, wait, I want to do more. I want to see, I want, I want bigger impact and scale's important. And obviously you went on to work at booze and, and other, and other places. And now of course at Cognizant where scale and impact is certainly important, but where did that start for you? Was that when you were much younger, where did this idea of like, okay, I want to, I want to have a big impact. I want to work and I want to have scale. To be honest, these things don't come to a student in school or, you know, it's it's an inkling. You you recognize that, you know, if all you're doing is using one small instrument to make one small notation, it's likely not, you know, the pen may be mightier than the sword, but it's not really going to, what's that, what's the phrase that Archimedes uh, used, right? Give me a lever and I'll move the world. Unlikely to actually happen. Mm. My first job as a pharmaceutical scientist working for a company that is today part of Pfizer um, it was called American Cyanamid. And the pharmaceutical industry has grown up through consolidation. So back in the 80s, which is when I started my first job, late 80s, early 90s, um, we used to use the phrase, no pharma company has more than 4% of, of any of the markets it's in. It was a remarkable story of fragmentation. And most pharmaceutical companies were just druggists who had developed some kind of formulation or a coal tar or petroleum derivative company, right? The earliest uh, German uh, uh, pharma companies were really derived from, from oil and gas derivatives. And so, th so there were was small shops and there was a huge consolidation wave. In any case, at American Cyanamid, my first introduction to sort of industrial engineering and industrial scale is when I realized there is something here that is much bigger than you. And there's no amount of you individually looking at the value chain and saying, I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. That will actually have the kind of impact unless what you're doing scales across, not just the capability, but across a people set, a, a process technology and people set that is hundreds of thousands so that it can reach the hundreds of millions that are out there that need this. Shifting into the opportunity you saw at Cognizant, did you come, was it from Accenture to Cognizant? Was that yes. the path? Okay. So obviously Accenture, you know, another massive consulting services organization, but describe the opportunity you saw at Cognizant. Clearly, you know, your background would tell me that you could have ended up in a lot of different places and you could have gone down a few different paths for sure. But what was it about Cognizant that drew you in from the outside looking in? Some of it is purely the the opportunism that takes place in life, right? Uh, I had talked to Cognizant at the same time that I had talked to Accenture about what was available. And at that point in time, Cognizant didn't have the kind of position that I thought I could have the kind of impact I wanted to make. But we had liked each other, and I truly liked the culture of Cognizant. Now, a little bit of it could just be the Indian in me and the fact that because of our onshore, offshore model and the way we sell and deliver at Cognizant, we have a fairly a decent sized Indian population. So, you know, 40 plus years, you can't take the Indian out of me kind of thing. <laughs> um, but but it, is, it is true. So, I, you know, there was something that just appealed to me that here we were serving a global market and a global audience. The majority of the decision makers and the economics of this business suggested that this was a G7 effort, right? That's where the value typically gets created. That's where most funding takes place. But the actual diaspora of people who contribute, you actually see them in, Places like Poland and India, and you know, so there's there's significant places where there's intellectual underpinnings to the business that otherwise looks like it is very much a G7 business. So I, I'd loved I'd loved a lot of things about Cognizant, but it wasn't the right role. So I started Accenture and begin to implement this hypothesis, which is clinical trials are not just about 
the identification of unmet medical need, the design of a clinical trial protocol to figure out what the evidence requirement is to prove or disprove the hypothesis, does this drug work and is it not toxic or does it have safety issues? That that at its core had to be translated into a, how do I do this in a, in a large scale and clinical development and clinical development operations, which is where the technology comes in, um, became something I got absolutely fascinated by. So there I was chugging along, learning, contributing, when Cognizant called to say, would you like to do what you're doing? Only do it across the entire R&D value chain. Mm. So do what you're doing and now enable better drug discovery and invention, then the clinical development process, then all of the data requirements that go into registration into so the regulatory process, and finally all the pharmaceutical safety and pharmacovigilance, the safety signal generation, which is so critical. Because the truth is, we release lots of drugs with statistical analysis telling us that they are efficacious and they're safe. But that is in patient populations that no matter how large are sample controls, right? Mm. We, we have to do this in the population and we have to monitor obsessively to make sure that we are not missing a data. And so all of, all of that, all of that was a chance to do at Cognizant at wow. scale with you know, hundreds of thousands of people at Cognizant involved with this effort. Wow. So what, what makes Cognizant such a healthcare innovator? Many reasons. So first is just the scale of what we do, right? So we operate um, in the top 30 pharmaceutical companies. We operate across the entirety of the value chain. In healthcare, which is payer, provider, and life sciences, we handle some of the largest volumes of clinical data, so payment processing and, and, and payer records. We operate across large medical healthcare systems, you know, the Mayo clinics and, and so on. And if you just add up the numbers and in terms of the, the many billions, that also is suggestive of how large the entire operation is and therefore how many places we touch. But what makes us an innovator? We take risks. And this is from our earliest days, right? If you look at the story of Cognizant, this could easily be, have been a company who just said, I'll do business process operations or something really small. But what in fact we've done is make digital business operations just a part of our service lines. That was risk. Second, we listen to clients, we listen to markets, we listen to the folks who work within Cognizant, our teams, who give us feedback on what's working and what's not, essentially answering a different medical question, but now in, the, in a business context, not asking the question, what is unmet medical need? What does unmet business need? Which encompasses sometimes in my business medical. And most importantly, it's a business necessity. If we were not risk takers, if we were not innovators, we would quickly end up being commoditized. Clients would say, I can get the same thing from someone offering me two cents less. So it's not just that we do it because we are passionate. And you can tell this really excites me. It's not just that because our heart says do it. It's also because it's cold, hard business logic. Wow. What, so interesting. Where where does healthcare, like the healthcare business, want to grow and expand even more? And, and, and how does how does marketing tie into this? Thank you. So these are two questions which we'll which we'll link up, right? Yeah. There's a whole range, the whole set of, of trends in our business. And I'll pick up just one to make a point uh, because there's many and we could spend our whole day today discussing them. But the journey to the cloud and the hyperscalers, the AWS is the Amazon uh, um, or Microsoft or Google Cloud, so the three major clouds, right? The, uh, cloud platforms. They are changing the way in which not just where data resides, how it's moved, how it resides, how it's accessed, how analytics are overlaid onto that so that insights can be drawn. They're also changing the ways in which we bring about connectedness. So things that we couldn't think about being able to do just you know, a few years back, which is could one device talk to another device, talk to a physician, talk to a nurse who was doing a separate monitoring or looking at a blood panel, could all of that come together with one view and one connected insight? Um, that's what the, the cloud-enabled movement and hyperscalers are allowing us to do. We want to participate in that and contribute to that and bring about a benefit to society and build our business, not just by working with the Microsofts and the Amazons and the very blasé sort of let's, let's do the plumbing, which we certainly can do, but also say, where are all the value cases so what are the, back to that unmet needs, 
where where can we solve for an unmet need that then someone will want to pay for once this is built? And we know that that these three dominant platforms, there's a few others, but I just mentioned the three largest, and then making sure that all of the appropriate patient records and the SOPs that are around patient management in the practice of medicine and around the clinical trial protocols and the clinical trial data and the real world outcomes and the evidence that comes about, all of these get connected, layered, allowed for insights to be generated, for new discoveries to be made and queried, in some cases, even entire in silico experiments being made, right? So there's this, I can, I can go on for hours, so please forgive me. We've been able to design clinical studies in which we use synthetic, entirely synthetic control arms, where we look at historical data, model this as a hypothetical patient, and say, why should we give a patient a placebo that we know will not be responsive just to, just to have statistical relevance when we can do the same thing with existing data and have a in silico patient representing the real patient, which frees up patients to get actual treatment in clinical studies, which in the case of oncology treatment, for example, with three and five months of survival can be a critical difference. It's huge, in the patient. huge. Wow. Um, so there's, there's a there's a lot there, and as I said, we can we can go go on. But the, the next part of this was marketing, right? To to me to me, there's marketing as competitive positioning, right? And we'll talk about that, and marketing as truth telling, and and sometimes I think we over rotate on one versus the other, but it's really both. Um, since I come much more from a drug background, I'll I'll use I'll use a drug example to make a point. So about thirty years back there were non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like Tylenol and aspirin and Advil, right? So these were already available in the market. And it was, it was marketing, and in fact, a very famous um, book published by, by a McNeil consumer products company executive called, called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind, right? Which mentioned that the key to marketing success was to think about how the consumer would look at the product, what, what was the attribute that would matter the most to them and make sure that your marketing message focused on that. To me in the drug business, it means don't put in all that fine print that's required from a regulatory point of view. That's not what the patient cares. What the patient cares, and back to my NSAID, the non steroidal inflammatory agent, is when marketing came to us and said, I need to be able to say to patients that my drug, Tylenol, I used to work there at one time, can be, can be dissolved in less than a minute. Therefore, it's available in your body, the first molecules available in your blood in less than a minute. Can you make that work? So it wasn't just marketing saying messaging, it was saying generate data, make this a truth for me. And that power of marketing to say what works, what's needed, driving innovation is, is important to me. right? And, and that it was driven by competition, I understand, but it, it was an important effect. And by the way, that small example is more you know, pain and arthritis and so on related. But we've seen the same thing with Lipitor versus uh, versus uh, Crestor um, for for cardiovascular outcomes, right? So, you know, it has even greater impact there. The second part is, part is truth telling. Marketing has allowed us to work with a community, a global community, to, to articulate messages about the importance of this industry. And some of my favorite marketing stories are around what, for example, Bio, the organization has done to try and tell the public, there are times when you may not like the industry model because it's highly innovation-based, which means we have to put lots of money. The money has to be recovered in the form of high prices, at least initially, and no one wants to see a life-saving drug being unaffordable. So we understand that. But think of the innovation and think of what would not be available if we couldn't do this. So a whole range of, in fact, TV commercials we've seen where Bio points out, the organization uh, points out the value of this industry and makes even lay people at my home go, oh, that's where you work. That's the industry you serve. How cool. I think that's important because we're able to then get society behind us. Wow. Can uh, uh, Let's stay on this topic of, of trends. Can you talk about another trend? I love the, the first about the journey to the cloud and cloud enabled. That's that's powerful. Indeed. Can you tell us another another trend that's coming up that's really hot right now? Thank you. So how about, we, uh, there's many to pick, but let's talk about cell and gene therapies, right? So, yeah. and let's pick it up, not a cell and gene, because that is, that's the technology, right? Let's talk about it in a different word that's a different phrase that's often used to describe these cellular stem cell, et cetera, technologies, durable and curative. And now let's unpack why durable and curative therapies are such an important trend. 
We all know that when you have a cold and you just take the palliative stuff, the symptomatic relief stuff, we're not particularly happy. It's like, yeah, fine, you made my, my fever go away and my nose stopped sniffing. Can you make the cold actually go away? So cure, not palliative. What if the cure wasn't possible because there was something within you, a DNA strand, a genetic code that was mismatched? What if you were born with an incredibly debilitating disease such as severe combined immunodeficiency, which colloquially is called bubble baby, right? So we've seen these pictures, I'm sure, we, of, of, of babies born that are put inside essentially plastic. Uh, the, and each year, depending on which country you're in and what's the cost of care, 300,000 to over a million is spent keeping them alive because their, their immune system is so severely compromised that we can't do much. There are therapies developed today in which a DNA construct is attached to a viral vector just for delivery, put into the body, and by changing the makeup of the nucleus, the, the stuff that codes for the RNA, that codes for the proteins, these children, in fact, a very famous case, Victoria, the, the first you know, cured case, are now walking about free. I mean, this is dramatically life-changing. So that trend, on the one hand, you know, medically we can go, wow, that's amazing. But now let's think about it from a business perspective. Our entire business model was built around one pill for millions of people. And now we're talking about one very complicated therapy for very few patients. So this trend to make it real requires changes in the way people are diagnosed and treated, in the way, in all of the processes that underlie, and all of the ways in which data are managed not just for managing the patient, but for all of the supply of the pharmaceuticals that will ultimately bring them to a cured state. And then finally, because you know, someone has to pay for this, and in our system we call them payers, right? The United Healthcare and the Aetnas now in government, the US government and through Medicare and Medicare and HICFA. These agencies also don't want to pay today necessarily the full cost of the so-called durable and curative therapy that will avoid all those future years of cost. And so they want a measure of an outcome that goes over multiple years and decades. All of that has to be built. And so this trend is not just about, wow, we've cured something. It's about, we have dramatically changed the system that will support the making available to patients this incredible, durable, and curative set of therapies. Wow. You know, it seems like there's so much obvious support and resources at Cognizant. There's a lot of velocity and innovation happening. But what what challenges have kind of come up? Because I see all of this. And there's a lot of innovation, a lot of things being created at scale. But what are some of the challenges and lessons you're learning? You know, because I'm sure it's not all roses and rainbows, right? But you have this big organization in Cognizant, a lot of resources, a lot of support that you can bring to the table, and yet you're still serving an industry that's still in many ways moving, lagging in some ways behind other industries. So there's gotta be some inherent challenges to you know to what's available. What are you coming across? I think the very first thing that we, we face in this industry is just risk, tolerance for risk, and worries about risk, and the concept of zero defect. You know, the moment a drug is released, and by chance, it actually has a incredibly bad side effect. And, you know, we all remember the, the thalidomide tragedy of years back, right, where, where a drug was developed that uh, essentially precipitated a complete redesign of the drug development system. Flipper babies is what the condition was that was called when, when pregnant w women took a drug that was meant to, to calm down their, their central nervous system and give them, give them a, a reasonably good night of sleep. But its, it's, uh, its side effects were tragic. That's an extreme, and of course, that is to be avoided. But even in recent times, we've seen a whole range of these discussions, including around vaccines. You know, are these safe um, in the case of COVID-19 vaccines? This risk tolerance issue becomes an impediment to innovation. And in fact, I think we could stay on the vaccine story for a while, right? To say, we are seeing such a hesitancy among a large percentage of the population that is really connected to not saying, does it work? But I will question if the efficacy is worth my perception of risk. And if that equation goes the other way, 
then this will not be allowed. So regulators have to be extra careful. Now let's use it. Let's tie this to something that we know we at Cognizant have worked on a great deal, not just in the collection of data and the pharmacovigilance systems, because we do everything from case processing through to the technologies such as RSG and, and so on that are part of a of a uh, approved set of technology platforms for codifying the data and analysis. Decentralized clinical trials. We had talked for well over a decade about why the world of clinical trials should move, had to move from all patients coming to one centralized clinical center where everything could be controlled so that there'd be no you know, variability in the, in the protocol and the data. And as a result of that, we get clean and pure data which would go into a, a good submission. We talked about why that approach may actually create problems. And the best example, by the way, I can think of is, would you ever do a sleep apnea study where you'd give someone a drug within, in a hospital setting? You know, just the very act of taking a patient away from their own bed and making them sleep you know, for seven nights in a hospital bed, that's like a massive Hawthorne effect, right? The experimental condition <laughs> changes the patient state. Decentralized clinical studies allowed us to have as a concept the ability to say, you stay where you are, we'll bring the medical practice to you, we'll, we'll administer the drug, we'll do all the monitoring. We knew that this was coming. It wouldn't have come about. Our clients wouldn't have been able to move if it hadn't been for the COVID-19 wave that began in March of 2020, right? Suddenly the world changed and our clients began to say to us, we know that you've got a lot of components of what will be a quiver of arrows in the DCT value chain, can you make this available to us? So while we'd been talking about it and doing this, you know, point by point from March of last year, this just became a big industry. And now, of course, DCT is very mainstay. Lots of regulations have been, have been released. I'll talk about a third point and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance to ask me more questions. Regulators themselves are uh, in response to real and, and sometimes perceived fear of backlash from consumers and legislators can sometimes create hurdles that come in the way of innovation and serving what in the end ultimately is the patient. And, the, and an example of that is the European GDPRs, these, these digital privacy rights that have in them all kinds of very nice sounding, you must do, you, you put one of them, and they, they allow for making sure that the patient is, a, is able to control their own data. Right, which is all very good. But a lot of clinical studies require that the physician investigators, the PIs, working with pharmaceuticals and with their academic medical centers and review boards to make sure that everything is protected and done in a kosher fashion, that, that they have access to these data sets and they don't con constantly require the patient giving consent. And yet GDPRs have put a block that makes it hard for existing trial design and processes to work. And so regulators can also sometimes, unfortunately, stifle innovation. Now, in many ways, from a, from a services point of view, I'd say, well, that just means more business for us. <laughs> but that's not the approach I want. The approach right. is, can we really solve for a, a genuine problem? Wow. We talk a bit about about the, the scale and impact of, of these decentralized trials. I saw you know, the, about 1,300 drug tr clinical trials with a virtual or decentralized component will start mm -hmm in the next year, representing this pretty big increase since 2021, a dramatic 93% boost from 2020, according to global data analysis. So, I mean, really interesting to see the data around these DCT elements. And I'm curious about what does this mean now for the patient experience, the payer, the provider, now that, that these kind of decentralized clinical trials are, are like you said, more, more open and more public now? Some things are known and some things are models, business models in progress, right? So I think anyone who very strongly claims the world has shifted from centralized academic medical center trials to DCTs, just laugh at them. And tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we do know is that there are some elements of decentralization that have incredible value to multiple constituents in the system. So let's start with the very first part of it, which is finding patients and having sticky patients, patients who want to be part of a clinical trial. Search engine optimization and querying through that set gives you a population set of patients who are for the most part significantly motivated. You know, if I went online and typed, you know, stage two pancreatic carcinoma, potential drugs in development, 
and you didn't have to know my name, you just knew that someone in California were searching, you would be thinking, there's a potential patient for the clinical trial I'm running. And if I can figure out a way to reach him through legal channels without initially breaking his confidentiality so he can volunteer for this, I'm going to have a patient. He's going to want to enroll in this, right? Uh, so that that is the the, the first part. The, the data set can be enriched through virtualization and decentralization versus the old fashioned way of having a patient show up in the doctor's office in a harried state with a caregiver doctor is giving him terrible news. You know, this is a very life threatening disease and we might, you know, with existing drugs, I think we can give you three to six months of, of survival. Um, and by the way, some of these drugs are incredibly toxic and the patient in the family is crying and thinking about, you know, what's, what's life suddenly turned to. And at the end of that, someone says, would you like to enroll in a, in a clinical trial? And you're going, no, no, I'll take these 40 pages and go home and I'll you know, forget about it. Right? So it, this is a very different way of finding the patients, um, enrolling them, identifying and enrolling. Then comes all of the paperwork around it. If that can be done in e-fashion, which it absolutely can be done in a DCT way, it also gives patients a chance to actually think this through Solve for things like, you know, what does this term mean? Let me ask my friend. Let me ask another physician. Let me go online and so So all of this process results in, in a more informed patient, better yields, and then most importantly, a return to an academic, typically an academic medical center, but a large medical center for any kind of treatment means that you have to absorb in that study the cost of the entirety of that medical center. You know, the million dollar NMR that is not required for this study is part of the capital infrastructure that gets allocated, right? So every study just gets hugely more expensive when all these costs are laden onto that one study. Whereas in the case of the patient who's getting dosed at home, yes, there are ancillary extra costs. We're gonna send a nurse or a nurse practitioner with a drug to your home who will administer this drug. So there's that cost, but it is not the cost of Stanford Hospital divided by a thousand patients. You know, it's it's just a dramatically different number. So it becomes more affordable. So and, and affordability in this case means we can launch many more studies, right? The portfolio gets larger. So the uh, truth can be generated faster. Monitoring at home or near home or with your uh, preferred physician, also an easier model. By the way, I, I said, I could go on, but through, through all of this, what we have shown is there are parts that work, whether it is remote monitoring, whether it is enrollment, whether it is e-pro, patient reported outcomes, a whole range of things that are all very useful. I think what we should posit today is this. When the dust settles, we will end up with virtualization and decentralization as a significant enough model with a whole range of functionality that will be part of a hybrid model in which some patients get treated in hospitals, some at home. The biostatistical models can account for that variability. So these are not two different kinds of patients. And that allows us to get to the ultimate submission to the regulatory agency saying, we have with good conscience run the clinical study and shown that this drug works, which is the one, the one we the, the claim we want to make, or it didn't work because that's what the analysis showed us. Wow. The data and intelligence that you must be able to to review and take in, it's got to be incredible. I mean, the things that you're looking at um, in your role, you know, as SVP there, what are, what's some of the intelligence that you're that you're looking at holistically, monthly, weekly? What are some of the metrics that you pay attention to? Well, it's a whole range of things, right? So it's everything from what are the drugs currently uh, crossing the barrier, essentially, from discovery into clinical development, because that is a measure of how vital this industry is and how much. Uh, economics uh, there will be in that. The second, of course, is our own macroeconomic factors. You know, in fact, especially right now in these troubled times, a question that's being asked is, will the pace of investment be allowed to continue if in fact we end up with a massive recessionary spiral? And so we, 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 look, we look very carefully at that. A factor I haven't talked about, but in fact I should have because it alluded to a question you'd asked me earlier, was a worry that we have is around, do we have all of the right people to serve this incredibly large uh, industry, this value chain in this industry that we are part of? And because we are living, even today, through the great resignation and the great resort of people sometimes just uh, moving to parallel jobs in a, in a different company, and no person joins a company and is typically productive on day one. So thinking through all of the productivity challenges and in our business, an error can sometimes mean that a data point 
that is critical to a patient gets thrown out. No one wants that. The patient doesn't want it. The patients enroll in studies because they also want to see their lives doing good. Leave alone how upset their physician and investigators get and the pharmaceutical companies get. So making sure that we handle the attrition and retention that is endemic to the industry at large, right? It's, whether it's you know, restaurant, food and business, or pharmaceuticals, we are seeing this. So we track all of that. And then I personally have a favorite that I'm tracking right now, which is really around how much of what we are doing is resulting in a bend in the cost curve. Because here's a weird thing. We haven't seen the Tufts Institute pushes out a paper that uh, is really around the cost of development. And with all that we have talked about for decades, we haven't seen the actual aggregate cost of development going down. But under that, there are layers of where specific, what we would call indications, specific disease subsets within, within therapeutic area categories, we are seeing that happen. So the reason the overall cost is not going down is because we are putting in a lot more diseases into the hopper now. And many of them with very novel and innovative therapies are resulting in failures in clinical trials, which are just costs that get saddled onto the system for the mm -hmm. few that get through the approval cycle. But if you look at the ones that are actually getting approved and just track their cost, and you do it as a, what, would, what did it cost 10 years back and five years back and now? You end up seeing that overall costs have gone. So this to me is very exciting. That we're now beginning to see that the all of the efficiency and innovation uh, changes that we've been making that we believe would take the cost curve, I should do it the right way, from going straight up to beginning to bend it, mm -hmm. we're be actually beginning to see it. And DCT is, is mightily helping in that in that too. Oh, that's huge. Um, a, a Forbes a Forbes article came out that talked about the rise, uh, you know, in tech companies sponsorships in Formula One, and Cognizant itself is now sponsoring a team, which I'm excited about. Being a Formula One fan myself, are are there any interesting strategies that you or your team has participated in to raise awareness about Cognizant's work in healthcare specifically? I'll I'll have to in this case talk about my own small world. I, so I, I won't I won't talk about Cognizant wide marketing efforts. We participate in everything from industry conferences through to okay. publishing papers. Um, this particular discussion is an example of where we make sure that our points of view and the good that we are doing are represented appropriately. We're not always sure, I'm certainly not always sure, that what we're doing essentially makes it to the evening news. I know it doesn't because my wife would be thinking I'm... But, you know, <laughs> doing a much more important job than she currently thinks I do, right? Uh, um, but I, I think I think we do as good a job as we can in a very, very technologically intense space and in life science in, in particular with, with constructs that you don't get across easily in a dinner conversation and try and communicate as much of, of that to the public as we can. Um, so it's the entirety of, of media and outreach and publications but as I said, I'm not sure I can answer for what our corporate group does because they do a whole lot more, all the way from our Aston Martin collaboration in Formula yes. One, which is fantastic, yes. um, through to the golf uh, tournaments that we are sponsoring. Um, and, and, and before I, you know, before I forget, um, from time to time in the healthcare business, we also work with payer and provider organizations, especially provider organizations, to make sure that we are able to support their needs. And one particular example just came to my mind, so I'll make it. We have a platform, Shared Investigator Portal, and it's been in the works for many years, and we've had to go through, and it's been released, so it already is, is available to over 200,000 users. Um, it's available over 30,000 sites. It's available in over 100 countries. It's been used in multiple in multiple clinical studies. Um, so all of that is good. Of course, every time we tweak it, some things work and some things don't, right? So this is and so there's a there's some degree of a pushback, you know. I didn't like this change. Or, I hate this change. You know that kind of. There's a range of, of a spectrum of feedback we get to. This is exactly what solved for my change. What we realized was the way we had designed SIP. There were certain medical centers that were of such a large size that their systems and ours clashed, and therefore SIP was actually not applicable to them in the right ways. It was creating problems. 
on our dime, we made the investment to fit SIP so that these very large centers, some of the, the largest oncology cancer centers in this country, are now able to use SIP and make it available for their clinical studies. So that's an example of the kinds of investments we make to make sure that it's available to the constituents we serve. That's huge. So I want to get your thoughts on kind of the future of Cognizant healthcare, especially given, you know, Avi, your unique vantage point. What will healthcare look like, let's say, in five years? Like how much transformation will we see? Well, let's talk about one of the most important forces that is at play in our business. And we'll talk about payer and provider. So we'll start there, right? So um, we, we, have, we have known for a long time that the ways in which money was separated from the provisioning of medical uh, services was really just about the insurance element and insurance is risk pooling. Insurance is, it's a long short game, right? It is, game may not be the right word, forgive me, <laughs> but it is making sure that you collect money today that may be available the next year and the year after for the desired expenditure, the medical expenditure in this case, but it could be for any, you know, property casualty has a similar kind of concept, right? We ended up with hyper-specialization that insurers uh, took part in, and that created this very large payer industry. And that was like almost wave one. You know, you guys, you doctors and medical centers, you become the providers, we'll become the payers, and it's almost like, and we are hyper-specialized, and that will create the efficiency gains the system needs. They began to recognize well over a decade back, the Rand Corporation was publishing papers, I think it was two decades back, saying there's something wrong with this model. The first HMO uh, um, concept was published by Rand 20 odd years back, right? And Kaiser Permanente showed, for example, an HMO where if you combine payer and provider and you focus on just outcomes, you actually remove the inefficiencies in that transactional uh, barrier between payers and providers. So for lower cost, you get some of the best outcomes. We haven't been able to, till fairly recently, um, understand how to take that model and almost like nationalize it without going into you know, politically charged terms like universal pair and you know, single pair. That, that I think is something I want to stay away from. But I think the ability to say convergence between pair and provider that is driven by focus on the, on the patient, on the outcome, will change the concept of capitation as we know it, and will allow for larger and larger systems to come about. And at the core of that, what we're seeing at Cognizant, at the core of that is the availability of data. So whether it is, whether it is patient health records, whether it is, it is medical SOPs, whether it is all of the DRGs and ICD-9s that code onto that, whether it is all of the outcomes. Doing all of that, putting that into one bin, if I may, not that it's you know, allowed to be, to be uh, for, for all kinds of privacy and, and purity of data reasons, allowed to put into a single thing and mesh, but allow, allowing us to do that and then pulling the analysis from that to say, what can we do best? What is the, what is the construct of cost that best matches the outcome? So I think we're going to see, are seeing a lot more of that, right? So I'd, I'd start there. And then I'd say, let's tie it back to something else we said earlier about cell and gene and durable and curative therapies. In order to pay for durable and curative therapies, every pharma company, to get the price that is even reasonably close to the kind of economic benefits they're generating, they have to be part of that same construct we just put together to say, now let's have value-based contracts that allow us to posit a value in the future and have the contract. So a mediation mechanism that allows us to get all the way there is, is part of this, this, this arc. And we're we are beginning to see this. So this is one big thing we just talked about. I'm gonna talk about another, which is slightly more prosaic, but nonetheless important. We're beginning to see surgery, get you know robotic surgery and not just robotic in the sense that there's a servomotor function with you know, a scalpel that is controlled by, by some very fancy gadget. It is the artificial intelligence that is generating exactly which, which part of the tissue is the part that needs to be where, where the incision gets made and is coaching the doctor or hinting to the doctor, you know, you may have wanted to go here, but go slightly, you know, two millimeters to your right. That ability of systems that are self-learning 
um, that are both looking at historical and looking at current data and then keeping on learning to, 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 to coach uh, physicians, giving us better and better outcomes. And it's not been just about the US, right? This allows us to say, if we do this right, there's a universal construct here. The best learnings in surgery can be applied to what the 8 billion you know, people in this world with, with robotic uh, surgical options. So that's the second one. And then a third one, and then, then I'll, I'll stop, is we're actually seeing a huge amount of moving all of this as closely as possible to a patient who is, who is a consumer so that consumers are getting to make choices. So whether it is, which physician do I trust? Which procedure do I engage in? Is this thing I was told about, let me do this and it'll give me that outcome, really correct? Or is it just someone saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a cardiothoracic surgeon, so I want to do open heart surgery, when in fact, a angioplasty might be better for me. Or in fact, just taking drugs for 10 years will give me the same or better outcome and I didn't have to do anything to be that interventional. All those choices being available, to a, to a patient. And I use a, you know, one example, this is now multiplied by the, the tens of thousands of disease types that we deal with. So it's, it's, it's getting very real, very fast to, to consumers and patients. Hmm. I, I want to, I want to get your, your thoughts on this Forbes article and then let's shift into uh, the lightning round, which is always fun. So there was an article in May of 2022 titled preventative healthcare compliance monitoring is a risk change agent. It goes on to talk about you know, ongoing care and maintenance, hospitals and healthcare systems can greatly mitigate the risk patient privacy violations posed to their organizations, more importantly, the patients they serve. When it comes to healthcare data breaches, it's not a matter of if it will happen, it's when. Uh, patient information is more susceptible to breaches than ever due to outdated legacy systems, a beleaguered workforce, and increasingly sophisticated threat actors. So the question is just, you know, data security is definitely a big concern in healthcare, as you know. Do you believe that this modernization of the industry will ultimately lead to more secure data? Yes, ultimately, yes. <laughs> okay. Right. I think the, the journey to ultimately yes might be somewhat complicated, right? And you and I, I'm sure, have been exposed to the same thinking that there will be, there will be phases where the most vulnerable point in the chain is where the, the data, the bad actor enters the system. There are uh, constructs to mitigate. So privacy keys are a part of that, algorithmic approaches. Um, we've seen that you know the entire digital tokenization are mechanisms to control for this. So there's all sorts of ways of saying, I can absolutely believe that there will be a day when the data will be incredibly protected. In fact, most recently I was part of a discussion which said, we can do multi-factor biometric combinations to ensure that only with that, so even when your doctor wants to access your data, he has to first call you, and the scan will be for your iris, your fingerprint, and maybe for me, the size of my nose, you know? And combine all of that to say, okay, therefore it really is of equal carne, you can have access. So it's not just, do I have your verbal authorization or do I actually you know, have the right pass key? So all of, all of that, all of that I can see happening. But I think the journey there is going to be fraught because we're still in the process of figuring out how to put all these systems together. And I think the point you made about, about legacy systems being problematic, at some stage they're introducing kinks in this armor and I'm not sure how we solve for that. Okay, very interesting. Um, are you ready for some lightning round questions, Avi? Yes, please. Okay, let's do it. So before we get into these, I want to give a nod to our sponsor, Salesforce. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. So thank you, Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. For those of you who want to learn more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. We have Avi Kulkarni, Senior Vice President at Cognizant. He's in the house, the virtual house. Uh, title is Senior Vice President, Research and Development. And the first question, Avi, is what's the last time you tried something new? Yesterday. My wife changed coffee flavors on me. <laughs> okay. Was that a good experience? <laughs> no, I want to go back to my acid-free Kona. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what is a life lesson that you learned the hard way? Years back, I, I wanted to do something and I tried to do it with uh, perfection. By the time I got it done, it was of no value. And I learned that lesson the incredibly hard way that uh, perfection simply doesn't, doesn't count in, in many situations. In fact, mm. perfection late is completely imperfect. Mm, I like that. What is, what's one activity that makes you lose track of time? Um, the conversation we are having. 
I think um, whenever you're having intellectually uh, nourishing conversations where you're looking beyond the horizon, you can talk for hours and hours and start thinking about the world that may be versus sometimes the world that is now, which is far more prosaic with you know hundreds of things binding us down. Mm, well said. If you could choose one book as a mandatory read for all high school students, which book would you choose? I would choose Yes, Minister, which is based on a British uh, show, but that same name, because it talks about organizational constructs and the hundreds of ways in which politics and bureaucracy can stymie the best laid plans um, of, of men. What's what's one thing you're betting on for the future? Could be personal, could be professional, but what's one thing you're betting on for the future? Beyond a doubt, my daughter. The, mm. the biggest investment we make in our lives are in the children that we either uh, bring up, in our case, my wife and I, you know, uh, had her, raised her, or invest in through the sponsorships that we that we engage in. That transfer across generations is the future of mankind. Mm, I love that. You, you've said a lot of brilliant things in this interview. And me as a father to a four-year-old girl, I appreciate that answer very much so. Um, what What's something that impresses you, Avi? Discipline mm. and hard work. Um, I, there's, there's lots of people who are brilliant, lots of people who are, are, you know, come up with inspirational stuff. There's a lot of, it's a lot harder to be grimy and sweat and, uh, and be tired and yet persevere, right? The, the, I'm not sure if it's a real story, but the story of Edison going through something like 18,000 metal types before he found the exact filament type that worked, that is just such an amazing story of grit. If I could communicate to, to children the one thing they should always do, it is don't give up, work hard, because at the end of that process, there is success. That's wonderful. If you had access to a time machine, where and when would you go? <laughs> I'm a fond of PG Wodehouse. So I suspect that my default thought would be, could I go back to that period before the Great Wars where the world was so much more innocent and, you know, and, and fly-by-night folks like Bertie Wooster were allowed to, to just have fun? This, by the way, is completely against the grain of everything I've said so far in today's discussion. <laughs> what is, what's your favorite app on your phone? I think it's the Gmail app because it allows okay. my, my, my friends to stay connected to me. Okay, I like that. You're the first person that said Gmail, by the way, so you have that, you have that record. Um, what is, what's a skill that you believe everyone should have? Cook for yourself. <laughs> I like that. If you could effortlessly pick up a new skill in an instant, what would it be? Faster reading, speed reading. Okay, okay. And last question, Avi, what's one thing that you would like to do this year that you've never done before? A triathlon. Oh. My, wife, my wife has bragging rights on that one right now. Okay, I like it. Okay, thank you, Avi. This has been truly insightful conversation. I mean, very inspiring, but very thoughtful. Uh, your perspective and experience in this industry is, is fascinating. Congratulations on all the momentum and cognizant, and especially the healthcare life sciences realm that you're in and leading. So thank you for being a part of Marketing Trends. This was excellent. Jeremy, thank you so very much. Very good discussion. As you could tell from the many times I paused, many of your questions made me really think. Thank you so much. Indeed, thank you so much. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to this channel for more great marketing interviews with today's top industry leaders. And thank you to our partners at Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. Head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing.